I must say, you're very wise to clap before my speech, because <laughs> at least once you'll clap for me, really, from the heart. <laughs> so how do you like my stylish pink robes? It, it occurred to me that I looked sort of like a giant strawberry, so I was trying to find a green hat, but all I could find <laughs> was this green tassel. But I think the effect is still pretty good. Um, you guys, on the other hand, look like a bunch of bumblebees. <laughs> so, so I was trying to get Mary Foy to change the recessional uh, march to be Flight of the Bumblebee, <laughs> but she didn't think it would sound so good on brass, so you guys, they're gone. <laughs> I, I was promised a backup band for my interpretive dance segment of my speech, so I guess I'm going to have to scratch that part. So, I want to spend most of my two-hour time slot <laughs> talking to the soon-to-be graduates, but first, I want to address your parents for a second. What did you guys do? You raised the most amazing group of kids I've ever seen. And I was thinking that you guys should really get together and maybe think about writing a book, um, one of these parenting guides, something like the guide, uh, the Parents of Johns Hopkins School of Medicine Graduates Guide to Raising Amazing Children. Um, I think it would be a surefire New York Times bestseller, Oprah Winfrey Book of the Month, and it would probably help you pay off some of your children's accumulated school debt. <laughs> so, g guys, I think your parents deserve a hand. So, as a father of two teenage daughters, if any of you parents uh, have any advice for me, I'll be by the punch bowl after the ceremony. Now, to, to this amazing group of soon-to-be graduates, there are a lot of dangers in giving a commencement speech. One might say too much or too little. One could easily fall into the traps of pretension or triteness or simply repeat things that have been said many times before. One could talk about politics or religion or atheism or money or sports, none of them my strong suits. One could go over the two-hour time limit allotted to me by the dean, and I'm sure he would not appreciate me trespassing on his generous time allotment. A local blogger summed up the dangers of inviting me to speak as follows. The risk instead may be that Lorsch will enthuse too much about the early days of RNA enzyme study. I cannot promise that I will not be pretentious or trite or tread on ground that has been well walked by many graduation speakers before me, but I will promise you one thing. I will not enthuse too much about the early days of RNA enzyme study. I want to talk to you instead about bumper stickers. In particular, about two bumper stickers I have seen while driving around Baltimore. The first said, don't believe everything you think. Here's the thing. And I hate to tell it to you so late in the game, but some of what we taught you is wrong. <laughs> no, don't worry, most of it's right. But some of the facts we taught you will turn out not to be true. Which ones were wrong? They're starting to look a little panicked down here, I gotta tell you. That's the trouble, we don't know. That's what you need to find out. Use the knowledge you have gained here, but constantly question what you think you know. Carry an ember of doubt with you and keep it glowing. I tell my lab that it is usually when things are the most confusing and making the least sense that you are on the verge of a breakthrough. At times like these, rather than abandoning the project, begin to question the facts. Now, some people say that to be a doctor, you just need to learn the rules. If you see these symptoms, you do this test and that test, and based on the results, you prescribe this drug or that drug. But ultimately, that is not why you spent the last four years in medical school, and why you're going to spend several more as interns and residents. You could have learned the rules, such as they are, in much less time. Your job, as MDs, is to figure out what is going on when things don't make sense, when the tests you are taught to use don't differentiate the diagnoses when the drug doesn't work the way it's supposed to. Robots will one day be able to do differential diagnoses, but turning the ember of doubt 
into a blaze of enlightenment will remain beyond them. They don't have the breath you have. Blowing on those embers is your job. Those of you among the graduate students who are unfortunate enough to be in my section of method and logic all those years ago may remember the series of classic molecular biology papers we read at the beginning of the course. We learned about the discovery of the double helical structure of DNA and about its semi-conservative uh, replication. And that's science, by the way, not politics. <laughs> we read the classic Benzer paper about the nature of mutations and then about how Crick used these studies to show that the genetic code uses words that are three letters long. Then we talked about our own Howard Dinsis' experiments that determined the direction of protein synthesis. And then we came to that sad, sad tale of the group who looked at these, the apparent simplicity of these results and assumed that all of molecular biology must be simple. They set out to determine the direction in which the ribosome reads the mRNA to complement Howard's studies on the direction of peptide synthesis. And they got it backwards. They got it backwards because they thought the experimental system they were using was simple, but it wasn't. And this made their data impossible to interpret correctly. They believed what they thought. You guys are incredibly smart, and you have done amazing things. You've passed exams with questions that weren't questions, <laughs> and with other questions that had three right answers. You have mastered skills, made discoveries and diagnoses, and pushed us all deeper into the frontiers of knowledge. But I'm afraid I have to tell you that you will still be students, even after Dean Rothman hands you your diploma that says you have a master's degree, or a PhD, or an MD. Even the august and erudite people behind me on this stage don't know everything. They are still students, too, and most of them graduated eons ago. <laughs> Confidence is important, to be sure, but the ember of doubt is just as important. Keep it with you and remember to blow on it, not just in the lab or in the clinic, but everywhere you go. Am I sure he is wrong? Am I sure I am right? Okay, I was in danger there for a minute of enthusing too much about the early days of RNA studies, so I'm gonna move on to the next uh, bumper sticker. The second bumper sticker said, it doesn't matter what job you do, it only matters that you do it well. When I first saw it on an old Toyota in front of me on the Alameda, I thought, man, that's stupid. <laughs> of course it matters what job you do. But then I thought about it for a minute, and I realized just how profound that sticker really was. Obviously, the job you do should be of some benefit to society. But beyond that, the point of the bumper sticker, at least as I saw it, was that you should strive to make yourself invaluable no matter what your role. You are going to hear from a lot of people, some of them successful senior colleagues, that you should focus on your own career. Just do what you need to do to advance your career goals, whether they are in neurosurgery, neuroscience, pediatrics, or public policy. They will tell you to say no to distractions like teaching, teaching assignments, or mentoring younger employees. They will tell you to decline committee service that doesn't advance your immediate interests, and in general, not to take on anything that is not an obvious step on the path from where you are to where you think you want to be in five years. But that is a bankrupt philosophy. You want to become invaluable, and you become invaluable by saying yes, by helping when people ask you to help, by diving headlong into teaching and mentoring. You become invaluable by doing things that are not in your job descriptions. That's what it means to do your job well. I want to close by giving you an example of someone who did his job well. My father-in-law, Joseph Saltzman, passed away at the end of March. He was born in Ohio, the son of an engineer. He was always fascinated by history, current events, and geography. During World War II, he was drafted into the US Army and sent to the European theater. He landed in, D in Normandy on D-Day plus two when the smoke was still settling. He was part of an Army intelligence unit under the control of Wild Bill Donovan, who later went on to help found the Central Intelligence Agency. Donovan apparently took note of the young Joe Saltzman and must have considered him someone who would not shy away from an assignment beyond his job description. 
Rather than having Joe read maps or aerial photos, his nominal job, he sent him across enemy lines somewhere in Belgium with the specific goal of being captured. The idea was that he would then escape from the Germans after a month or so in captivity, bringing intelligence and other allied prisoners with him when he did. The actual merits of this plan may have been dubious, but Joe was successful in getting captured, perhaps the easiest part of the job, and was also successful eventually in escaping from the Germans and making his way back to allied lines. The heroism of his acts uh, is only slightly tempered by the fact that his captures actually escaped with him so they could surrender to the Allies rather than face the Russians advancing from the east. Joe was awarded both the Purple Heart and the Bronze Star for this adventure. After the war, he went to the University of Montana where he majored in forestry and became a smoke jumper, parachuting into wildfires to put them out. He jumped on the infamous Man Gulch fire that claimed the lives of 12 other smoke jumpers. When the time came to find a longer term and perhaps longer lived occupation, he followed his interest in history and current events and headed to Washington to take a shot at a position in the diplomatic service. Partly because of his work for Wild Bill, he soon found himself with several offers. He spent the rest of his career representing the United States overseas in Iran, Morocco, France, and Switzerland. Most of his exploits are sadly lost to history but it's clear from the few of them he told me that he had extraordinary adventures and he did great things for our country. I had the sad privilege last month of seeing him buried with full military honors, a 21-gun salute, taps, a folded flag, in Arlington National Cemetery. So why am I telling you about Joe? Because Joe was not someone who spent much time thinking about his career trajectory and how to optimize it, yet he did great things. And he was not alone in this outlook on life. He was an archetype of the greatest generation who said yes to doing things that were not in their job descriptions or on the immediate path to their career goals. They did extraordinary things because they said yes, not in spite of it. They did their jobs well. I hope you will look, on, uh, look to their senses of adventure and their willingness to take on challenges, whether they were on career pathway or off of it and use their generation as your role models. So today, you and I are proud graduates of this extraordinary institution together. I hope you'll miss Hopkins as much as I know I will. These are incredible people standing behind me, incredible teachers, incredible scientists, incredible physicians, and incredible mentors. You are where you are today because they said yes. So to thank them, instead of applause, and this I hope is how traditions are born, can I hear one giant bumblebee buzz? <laughs> yes, thank you very much, and congratulations.